Hey, Jeff, can you hear me okay? I can indeed. Can you awesome. hear me? I sure can. Good, good, good. So Carrie's going to introduce me, and then I'll talk for a couple minutes, and then I'll bring you on. All right, that sounds good. Do you uh, <clears throat> do you know how to share video on Zoom, like using the advanced tab? Uh, yes, I believe so. It's been a while, but let me, I can just, uh, just click into there and I'll point out, point out to you. So you click share screen, then you click the advanced at the top. Yep. And then, and then it just goes choose the screen, right? Well, you pick the, you actually can pick the video file. Okay. And then make sure that you have the two bottom check boxes checked there because that'll optimize and it'll include this. Uh, so it doesn't let me do it or even choose anything on it because you're sharing something right now. Right, well, let me stop sharing. You can try it out. All right. Um, all right, so you said go to advanced. Oh, and you said click those two options. Got it. Yep. And then if I do video, and depending on, so how much time do we are we gonna have we're going to have half an hour and then we'll throw it to JSEC from Occupy Mars. Okay. So, yeah, it'll go fast. Yeah. So half an hour, you said, right? So I might not even show video just because it might slow it down a bit. Um, unless you want me to. It's one of those things. How long is the video? Way. I mean, we can make it short or long. I've got it there. Yeah, I think we're good without it to avoid any interruption. There's a jump between. Yeah, we can um, always we can always share it out later. Exactly. Yeah. Okay. Cool. Um, yeah. Yeah. That's that might be easier. Do you see the settings in there? The I settings? do. Yeah, and it's trying to get me to load that file. So yeah, we're good. Just okay, make sure you check the boxes at the bottom of that screen. You see those? Yeah. And for you and me, for that time, um, how do you want to? How's that going to go? You just gonna lead? To I'm gonna yeah. I'm gonna basically t introduce the project a little, and I'll throw it to you, and then I can jump in. Okay. Do you want to pull up the slide from your side on that PDF? Yeah, sure. I have it open here. Well, you can just take full control in, because I think I've got everything in there. And if they say, "Oh, can we see it?" or something, or if we have time, then we can always come back to it. And that way you'll actually be a little bit more interactive because then you can add some color and commentary as well. Sure. Not just me. You're cool with that? Yeah, absolutely. Joint effort after all. That's right. All right, I'm gonna go ahead and go on mute. She'll introduce us at 7.30. Sounds good, I'll do it.
Alt Space, would you like to do a sound check? Soundtrack one, two, three. Coming through loud and clear, hot space. Hearing anybody. Great. I'm going to go ahead and meet you. We're about to get started. Okay, everyone's about to come in in about 12 seconds. <laughs> you ready, Carrie? As ready as I'm going to be. Good evening, good afternoon, or good morning, everyone, and welcome back to the Mars Society Virtual Convention. Um, I want to thank everyone for being here. Um, hopefully you've enjoyed the conference so far. I am very excited tonight um, to introduce the special panel about digital entertainment, and um, I'm just going to take a brief moment to introduce our moderator for tonight's event, our own James Burke who is our Director of Information Technology and Mars VR for the Society. James is a founding member of the Mars Society and leads our Seattle chapter as well. He has been a key and a very important volunteer for a very long time. He has also been the one making sure that everything has been running smoothly for our conference, meaning all the technology that we have going on. Um, he is just wonderful and he is great uh, with everything that he does for us and we are extremely lucky to have him uh, be part of the Mars Society. Um, so James is going to show our Mars VR project, uh, which we are all very excited about and I hope that you are all excited about it too. Enjoy. Take it away, James. Thank you so much, Carrie. Uh, welcome everyone. Good evening. I'm really excited to be talking to you tonight about Mars VR. And it's a project that, it was about four years ago that we started working on this uh, at the Mars Society. Uh, we had a conference in Irvine, at University of California, Irvine. And back then there was a project called HP Home Planet by Hewitt Packard. And um, that same event, we also had a big tour at JPL 
that a bunch of us went on. And so it was kind of those two events There were, we kind of were looking at VR and then we saw some VR at JPL and a bunch of us got really excited about it and we started on this journey. We did a Kickstarter in 2018 and we raised $31,000. We were able to take that money and scan our Mars Desert Research Station in Utah using the latest techniques. Uh, we flew a fixed wing drone and got a square mile of terrain. And then we used techniques for photogrammetry, which is the science and art of taking a real life place or object and putting it into VR. We were able to create a version of our campus in Utah and all the buildings inside and out, put that into VR. And then I went and showed that to a bunch of, at a bunch of different events uh, here in Seattle at, a, at our conference in 2018 and 2019. Um, and we thought that, you know, this is a really great proof of concept, but let's do this, you know, let's do this for real. Let's do this engineering grade. And um, I, I want to take a moment to thank some of the early contributors like Shannon Norell and Azad Balabanian um, and others who, who helped us out. Um, James Earhart, Sasha Greer were our key donors for phase one. Um, so recently in the last couple of years, I've been begun partnering, we've begun partnering with Jeff Rayner here in Seattle. And I'm gonna bring Jeff on now. Jeff is the CEO of Mixed Reality, a VR company. Um, and they've done a lot of different, really innovative work, a lot of different projects. And so Jeff and I have been working together for a couple of years on Mars VR. And we decided, why don't we go ahead and do another crowdfunding campaign? And we did that earlier this year. This time, our goal was $100,000. And we exceeded that. We, went, we got $106,000. I want to especially thank Jenny Rankin uh, and Roger Rankin, who are our major donors for that. But we had over 200 supporters. And so now we've been hard at work this summer. And we're ready to show you what we've come up with. Um, I'm going to go ahead and uh, so welcome aboard, Jeff. Good evening. Hey, James and everyone. So I'm going to go ahead and share the slides uh, we have. And so this was our um, our Kickstarter graphic uh, or our Indiegogo graphic. We did a bunch of great videos um, and the whole slogan was learn the science, live the journey. And as I mentioned, we had a successful Indiegogo campaign. We got support from a lot of people and uh, we're very proud that uh, we're, we've been able to, to do this. This is actually the most successful VR campaign on Indiegogo. Just tell me when you want me to jump in as well, James. Um, no, I mean, feel free. I mean, this is, you know, we've been working together on this. Um, you know, we kind of, you know, there's, we, we basically came up with three different environments at this point. So one of the things that we were able to do, which is actually part of the conference, if you look on the Attendify app and you look in the left navigation, there's a virtual MDRS link that actually goes to our, our static environment, our MDRS 360 environment, which we created from a bunch of Matterport scans we did at the, of the campus. Um, so Jeff, why don't you talk a little bit about that? There's some exciting features inside that that people might not know about. Yeah, and so let's actually start um, to give everyone a little recap. This whole Mars VR term that we're using has actually been expanded out, right? We, as we started the Indiegogo campaign, we listened to everyone's feedback and also the feedback of not only the Mars Society, but any of their members, the astronauts, scientists, students, uh, software and hardware creators that were doing things similar, and some of those you're going to hear from in a moment, and just anyone who ever space in, who's a space enthusiast, really. So we got all that feedback. So what we'd initially planned with with Mars VR uh, was essentially a, a special education and training experience to take people to the Utah desert, essentially, and to really go through what it's like to understand being an astronaut in training. As we did that, though, and we listened to all this feedback, we realized that, in fact, there was there was more to it than that. And we could actually still provide all of that. At the same time as we launched this campaign, we had these landers um, approaching Mars and actually touching down and sending back some data. 
So it was really fascinating to get everybody's feedback real time to say, oh, can you use the NASA data that Ingenuity and these others are producing? And so if you were following along James and I's like uh, podcast, as it were, on a weekly basis, you'll hear that we were adapting actually from our initial idea into more. So the core of it was still we had to reproduce an, at least an experience that, that covered the core training from the MDRS. And we actually decided to actually split it into two parts. One where we would leverage everything that was done before and take it to the next level. And as James said, that was what we're now calling MDRS 360. And what that means is we actually put it into a, a 360 tool, but we've added some real fun, special uh, things in there, which, uh, which really take it to the next level. So the key, the key things about it are that it is, it is very lightweight. And so it's, it's web-based. That means that you can actually uh, tour it alone or even in a group, you can actually have someone presenting and touring you around. It means it's very accessible because you can use any device you have. It's not just VR. You can use it on a phone, an iPad, or a computer, or even a VR headset too. And James is pulling it up here in the background. Uh, so you can get a personal tour or you can go all the way around it. The key concepts of that were that you're still able to get an experience, but you don't have to have a VR headset. It means you can collaborate. You can still learn some of the core things that you will do in the, the VR experience, but it's just open to everybody, irrespective of device you have, any abilities or disabilities. It's easy for schools and things to pick up on it as well. Yeah, and this is a great tool because it can be used on any browser. You don't need any special hardware. This can really help us tell the story of what we do at the MDRS. And so I'm right now, I'm kind of clicking around in it. I'm just using my mouse and um, my monitor. This is just a regular computer. And you can see this is all around, you know, this is what it's like to be at the MDRS. And uh, you, we also have sound. James actually gives you a personal tour that was preloaded in there that gives you an option of actually getting his feedback about the different buildings and their purpose. Uh, and there's also a lot of Easter eggs in there. One of them, that anybody who contributed, so over 200 people who contributed to our Indiegogo campaign is in there if you can find them, and actually a couple of spots, plus about another 50 or so Easter eggs. So lots of, whether it's fun facts, where it's things about the contributors, where it's uh, interesting things about MDRS itself, there's a ton of experiences, ton of little, little things to keep that interest alive. So we're excited for people to try this out. Um, but that's not the only thing that we've built so far. So Jeff, do you want to talk a little bit more about our second experience? Yeah. So the, the one issue we had with the drones and photogrammetry stuff, uh, while it was very fantastic, once you create that experience, you can't adjust it, or at least not very easily. And it's hard to improve it because if there's, for example, a big sun at a certain time of day, that shadow is baked onto the environment. You can't adjust it. Doors that are closed remain closed. Objects that are in the real MDRS, that you can't clean them up, at least not very easily from all of the tour. Uh, but most importantly, it was it's a little bit harder to get a really interactive in experience. And so the whole concept there is let's take it to the next level and make it fully immersive and optimized for VR. So this next area is really where it's designed for astronauts or students really wanting to have a full understanding of what does it take to live on Mars? What do I need to learn to live, survive and thrive on Mars? Uh, and at least what it's like at the MDRS specifically. So it's geared for the MDRS with the obviously the, the reason being that it gives you a taste of what it would be like to really be out there. Let's see, let me click through some of these slides. Um... Do you want to talk a little bit about some of the, uh, and I can take it if not, but some of the, well, actually, yeah, while you're here, James, flick back one, well, yeah, go one, two, three, as it were there. So here's the MDRS 360 environment we just showed. And again, this works on any device. It's meant for as a guided tour to kind of acclimate someone to what we do in Utah. Um, it's, it's extensible. We actually could use it as a meeting space too. There is a feature where you can actually give people a live guided tour 
almost like a Zoom call and you can have multiple people in that at once, all works within the browser. And then for the second environment, this is designed to be used with a headset, a virtual reality headset. It's fully immersive. And this is where we're going to have all the training that we've been planning to build so that we can train our crews in VR before they go out to Utah for real. And but the whole idea would be that they can get acclimated to what they're supposed to do in Utah before they get out there so that when they hit the ground, when they get there, they can hit the ground running. And on this next slide, you'll see actually the evolution. So the photogrammetry version is here with some holes that you just didn't get picked up. We did clean those up along, along the process, but then you go to the next slide, James. So it takes it from the photogrammetry to now the optimized version in VR. And you can very quickly see a lot of the differences and you have a lot more control over the environment, the light, the shading, the optimization of the uh, 3D models and stuff too. You can open the doors and you can pick objects up, etc. But we also want to announce today that we're taking this to a whole new level too. Um, as we've gone, been going through the optimization, we've been able to make it very photorealistic as well. So this is actually the latest environment that we're building off of. And we're going to be releasing not only some videos on this, but also anyone who backed us will have uh, priority access to this over the upcoming days because this is testable right now. Uh, so we want to get everyone who um, actually helped us get to where we are today to be the first people to try it. And then we're going to release it out uh, at, at James and Mars Society's discretion uh, in the near future to everybody else. Yeah, and the whole idea is that we're going to have this as a free download on Steam. Um, we're going to give this away, essentially. We want this to be a research tool. We want it to be widely used. Um, we will have some unlocks that we kind of at, have, you know, have paid DLC uh, on top of it. But the base core experience will be free for everyone, and it'll be widely available on the Steam platform. James, do you want to talk a little bit about some of the training programs that are uh, within inside Mars VR? Well, yeah, absolutely. VR now. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. So, you know, there's a, there's several different tasks that a crew member at MDRS needs to learn. Procedures like how to put on your spacesuit, how to go through the airlock, how to use some of the facilities, how to, how to use the kitchen um, and the science dome and the RAM, the, the engineering um, work center on the left there. Uh, how to use the observatory. Uh, it's, it's now a solar observatory, but it's still actively used. And the green hab, how, how to get acclimated there, how to maintain the plants. So we're gonna build, working with Shannon Rupert and the MDRS team, um, we're gonna build training that really tells that story that allows people to learn how to be a crew member at MDRS through this virtual reality application so that when they go there for real, they're ready to go. They've, they've learned, they've been certified, so to speak, and, and how to be a crew member. And it's also the a kind of experience that we can and will expand over time too. We have uh, six training modules out of the gate, and then we are looking to expand upon those once we've got everybody's feedback, once we figure out where everybody would like us to go in the future. Uh, the next slide talks about some of the extended ideas that we, we're hoping on a lot of these, these concepts to actually mirror them both in the Utah desert with MDRS as well as the Mars VR version itself. So for yeah. example, driving a rover, flying a drone stroke ingenuity, you can do this both in the Utah desert and on Mars. Sorry, James. No, 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 you're, you're fine. So, so again, we're, we, we're now talking about the third environment that we're creating which is focused on Mars. And so we're taking the terrain from Mars using real NASA data and putting that into VR, but also adding in some of the real missions that have happened, the, the different rovers, the Ingenuity helicopter and other features that really make it realistic. So we wanna have extensions to Mars VR that allow you to use the latest technologies such as haptic suits, haptic gloves, um, treadmills. You know, there's lots of different hardware vendors out there that we've been talking to. One of our partners on the Indiegogo campaign was a company called Yaw VR that makes essentially a motion simulator for driving. And so we're going to integrate that and allow you to drive a rover 
like the rovers we have at MDRS, the Polaris EVs that people use while they're there, we're going to essentially have a version of that that you can drive in Mars VR. And using almost any VR headset that exists. And some of these experiences, you won't actually need VR for. It's better, I can tell you that. When you are flying Ingenuity, for example, and in the screenshot behind James, uh, on the screen here, or even behind me, these are different parts of the experience that are screenshots from it, all right? So this is real imagery from it. And what, the way we've built that is actually layered together about seven different NASA data elements. And then for everyone who's not fully aware, the quality of those is not to the standard that we need them to create this experience. It's basically about 50 feet for, for, one, uh, for one pixel, which is great when you're at, at 10,000 feet, but terrible when you're on the ground, walking around, driving around or flying around. So what we've had to do is uh, fill in the gaps, as it were. Similar to when we did the photogrammetry stuff, you could see there were gaps. We have the same problem here. And uh, it's actually been a really fun and amazing experience to build this out, fly around it in a helicopter, uh, or ingenuity kind of drone helicopter, and actually look at this environment for the first time. Over the next few days and weeks, we're going to be showing you some of the work that we've done. Prime example is the size of some of the meteorite craters. We were testing out where should we actually build this experience. And uh, we started... James actually came up with this idea, first of all, let's, let's try it in, in one of the meteorite craters. As we did it, we realized it is so big that it just looks like you're in this, this huge dome. And we need to put the video out to show what that's like. And you see it, and it's just inspiring. It really does. If you go there to Mars, the first people who go there, hopefully in just the next few years, um, it is incredibly large expanse of mostly nothingness, which is something we're not really used to here on Earth. But uh, I, I can't wait for the, to get the, the first feedback of people who actually get there. But this is pretty close to what those people are going to be experiencing. Jeff, do you have a video you'd like to play to show them some of this? Yeah, sure. I can spring something up here. Do you want me to share it? Absolutely. All right, so let's go to um, share this. So first of all, let's do share screen. No, I'm just going to actually do this. To be, just share everything for a moment. All right, so first of all, you guys see this? Yes. Perfect. So I just put this in fast motion, but this is actually on, on YouTube right now. So this is just me flying around, for example, around Mars VR. Now, note the coloring is not exact because we don't know the exact coloring. But based off of, as I said, all of these different levels of data, so like, for example, red, blue, green, different filters that Mars give us, uh, height map data, uh, and all these amazingly different data sets, some at different qualities and altitudes and stuff, means you have to do a lot of guesswork. But the core of this is actually based exactly off of Mars data. So it's incredible when you fly around this for the first time and you think this actually is based off of Mars. This isn't just made up in a computer. So I remember when we first started the project, we wanted our sort of goal for the terrain was to show fist size rocks. <clears throat> and it was really hard for us to do that at first. I mean, we had taken a bunch of photos, but I think we took over 10,000 high resolution photos with the drone. Of the, of the Utah terrain, but we were we were not able to process it to the level where we could see fist-sized rocks at first in the first prototype. Now, not only are we at fist-sized rocks, we're at grains of sand, it seems like. And that, <laughs> so it's very impressive to me how far we've come in four years. Uh, and this one is a, just a quick view. I might have to mute this because you'll hear James speaking, which is a good thing, obviously. Uh, but this gives you an idea of actually the, the Mars, sorry, MDRS VR experience. So to be clear, we started with this idea of Mars VR. We've now split that into three different experiences. MDRS 360, the very accessible one. Mars, uh, sorry, MDRS VR, which is the VR version with the full training. And then Mars VR, where we essentially take the core concepts, take it to Mars and like to really fully explore it. But let me play this. Of course, the uh, toolbar is right in the way. There we go, all right. I'll just uh, put the mute on for a moment just to, to avoid that. 
but you you fly in just to get started and then you'll land here and then you'll be actually taken around by James for the initial part where actually he'll explain about the different buildings and the things that you can see and do. Uh, and in fact, the things you're gonna have to do as part of this experience. And the, the first part is a purely guided tour. And then we move on to the, the modules for the training and they're actually in a very specific order so that you learn just as the astronauts in training learn as well. And we try to give people lots of different visual cues so that people don't get confused or lost what they're supposed to do. And then and James, I see a lot of questions coming in. I don't know if yeah. you, you want to uh, you want to address those. But... I can take some of those right now. Um, yeah, okay. And if we can, if you want to just show that last slide there, I'll stop sharing. Absolutely. Let me do that. And just to finish off what you were saying just a moment ago. And that is basically, is, which is the, the where next, right? Oh, got it. Yeah, and, and that is, so we're now at a really good point where we have actually alphas of all three experiences. In fact, for the MDRS 360, it's actually ready to go live. For MDRS VR, uh, we're definitely on the alpha phase for that as we're now building out the training experiences. So this is just this week, we are ready to go live with the alpha and the training experiences will be coming out to turn that into a beta. And James, the Master Society will be releasing those initially to any one of the backers. Um, but if you are interested in, in getting early access, let everybody know. And then the, uh, the Mars VR will also be coming out any day uh, for the, the alpha version as well. As we've done that though, we're now looking to make this even more accessible and more a deeper immersion level on all of these experiences. So things that we'll be including, James mentioned the Yule VR, which is that, that green chair-like object there. Uh, where you can actually, when you fly or or drive around, you will feel like you're driving and flying. When uh, we're going to have the, the full body haptic suit for anyone who's able to experience that. So part of this is also taking this on the road and be able to show students at, at schools, at universities and museums. Uh, the yes. top thing is the smell. So you can actually smell some of these, uh, these experiences to get a little bit better. And then you've also got different ways of, of moving from the walk box to the 3D rudder, to the cyber shoes and to the infinite deck. All right, James. Yeah, that is one you. of our goals, Jeff mentioned schools and museums. I mean, that is one of our long-term goals of the program for Mars VR is to get this into museums as permanent displays, using some of the hardware you see, getting this into schools, having like a way to do assemblies at a school where kids can try this out, students can try this out, so. Um, let's take some questions though. There's a few questions and I wanna be respectful of our next presenter. Um, so one question that Doug B has, will the optimized Mars VR models be available open source? Yes, we actually have some already on Sketchfab. We've been releasing some of those throughout this year. Um, some of the work that was done for phase one and two is already out on Sketchfab. And that is the goal that we are creating 3D models that, we can, that, that can be used in other projects. And actually, James, that's a good point to bring up the alt space experience too, uh, because there might even be some of those in there as well. Yeah, we actually have imported into alt space for this conference um, a couple of the models that we created for Mars VR. So you see that if you guys in alt space see the hab, that that was part of our Mars VR project. Um, next question: Does Mars VR have any curriculum? Um, we we do we did mention that we're doing some training for the MDRS. That's our first set of curriculum, um, specifically for analog astronauts and and prospective analog astronauts to kind of tell the story of that. Um, and then we also are going to work on uh, K through 12 curriculum. That is definitely something we want to have long term, and um, we'd love to get partners to help us with that. You know, we'd love to get education partners. Uh, that can that are um, have experience building curriculum out from VR, but it's definitely one of our long-term goals. Uh, Alt space, do you guys have a question? Since we just mentioned you, um, and if not, I will keep going. There's a couple more here. Are you Alt able space. to hear us? Okay. Yes, we can hear you. Go ahead. Oh. Oh, that's easier. Okay, yeah, I just typed you a question. I'll read it for you, though. That's much better. Um, this is from Oria Apples. Actually, you know what, Oria, is your mic working? If it's working, like, uh, now you could go ahead and ask it yourself. Let's see, it was having trouble earlier in the day. I'll see if it's working, otherwise. Uh, 
No, it looks like it's still broken. Okay, so Oreo is asking, are there avatars in the models? Is it all first person view, single player, multiplayer? Jeff, you um, want to take that one? Yeah, sure. At the minute, so we do have the possibility of making it multiplayer. Uh, that's something that we're definitely experiencing, uh, going to have a certain experience for. Because a lot of it is training based, um, several, most of it will be will be single player for now, at least. But we'll look to do more, especially if James wants to talk about the the, the exploration part of it. In future iterations, we will definitely come back to doing joint tasks and things like that. Yeah, the long term vision of Mars VR, which Dr. Zubrin has talked about lots of times, is we want to have astronauts being able to work together with folks using VR back on Earth. So the idea would be that when astronauts land on Mars and they scan their landing site, putting all that in the VR environment back on Earth, and then people could crowd explore the environment and they could help the astronauts triangulate where to go that's interesting. That's the long term vision. We want to test that out in Utah. We want to have a capability for someone inside the hab to have a VR headset on and go along with someone out on EVA with a suit on. Um, and that's one of the things we'd like to test out in the next year or two. Any other questions, Altspace? Great to see you guys. I'm glad this is working out, uh, this connection we have. Go ahead. All right, um, I'm gonna go back to the Q&A panel. We'll take one last question before we bring on JSEC and, um, for the Occupy Mars. I think Mars. we have one in alt space, sorry. Oh, go yeah. ahead, go ahead, how please. Are, how are those shoes different than the uh, full um, track type thing in terms of motion? Jeff? Oh, so there's actually several ways. The side, the cyber shoes, there's a 3D rudder, and there's also a walk box. A walk box is suitable for people with disabilities that can't move their feet much at all, or just people who want to be seated and make oh. it easy. The 3D rudder is actually like a disc that you can, for example, lean forward to go forward. You can twist to the side to turn to the side. Uh, so it's, it makes it really nice and easy. Again, if you're at a seated desk, for example, the 3D, sorry, the cyber shoes are a way that you can actually physically run. So you have a special seat or just a stool for that matter that can pivot around and you can physically run while seated down and move around the experience that way too. So it's a little bit of everyone. If people have those, they can uh, experience it even in a better way. Uh, you don't have to have them, but it does add to that immersion. And also, you know, it, these are our partners. These are things that we like to build the whole ecosystem together and give everybody mm -hmm. uh, the deepest possible experience. Okay, thanks. Any other questions here from Altspace folks? Just step up to the mic if you do. And I love the fact, one thing you can't see right now, of course, in alt space, they have this uh, this presentation being presented on a live screen. So they're in VR watching the Zoom. It's, it's fascinating how you can bring these different metaverses together. Yeah, it's great. It's It's been a really great success having alt space at the conference and um, having people go into the environment and participate. We've been doing that all for the last three days. It's great. So um, I want to go ahead and um, wrap this, wrap up our portion of this and bring on JSEC. So um, thank you very much, Jeff, for participating. Hang out, please. So JSEC, uh, I'm going to bring you on now. And you are the CEO of Pyramid Games. And we're really proud to be partners with you um, on, on both Mars VR and with future Kickstarters and Indiegogo campaigns you may do. With, um, with your project, Occupy Mars. I think Occupy Mars is really, a really exciting project. Um, I've been waiting for someone to do something like that. And so t I'd love for you to tell us all about it tonight. Yeah, thank you, James, for introducing me. Uh, do you see my camera or can you hear me? Yes, you're coming through loud and clear. Okay. So uh, it's great to be here with you, James, Jeff. You do an amazing job with the Mars VR. Uh, it's great that there are so many initiatives like that uh, happening. And, and uh, yeah, and now I'd like to tell you a little bit about our project, Occupy Mars. Uh, maybe I will share my screen. So basically, Occupy Mars is a game. An idea for the game started in... Uh, like many years ago when I was at the university, 
At first, it was t supposed to be a strategy game. Uh, but in 2017, we created the first trailer and started uh, the production of, of the game, which, uh, which you see now. So uh, in Occupy Mars, we want to reach to the players, like the typical uh, PC or console uh, players. So we want them uh, to uh, experience uh, the first Martian colony, how, how they would look like, what they should do to survive, like, for example, 100 years from now. So um, we want our game to be uh, as exciting as possible for the general public to get people excited about Mars uh, colonization. So we have prepared multiple game modes. Uh, uh, there will be a tutorial mode where players can learn all the basic functions of the game. And surviving on Mars is pretty complex. So people have to learn uh, electricity, uh, like uh, generating uh, water, uh, oxygen, like the uh, Sabatier reaction, and uh, all the other. We will have the sandbox mode where players will be able to choose their static locations, difficulty level, uh, like the, uh, how harsh are their weather conditions. And in the campaign mode, we want to show the story where uh, players will be able, able to experience something like a movie firsthand. So we want it to be as exciting as possible, something like uh, in the movie The Martian or in the book. So the, there are three pillars of our game, base building, exploration, and survival. So a player needs to survive. There is a lot, uh, a lot can happen on Mars, a lot can kill you. There can be cold waves, dust storms, solar storms, uh, meteor showers, radiation. Uh, there is an exploration part uh, where uh, you have to gather uh, various re resources. Sometimes you have to find the best place uh, to, to extract water from or where uh, there are some, uh, for example, uh, rocks rich in iron or different, uh, different elements needed for 3D printing. And once you gather your resources, you can start building the base for other colonists who will join you. So basically, uh, you are at first you are alone and later you will have some uh, people who will join you. So this is basically how it looks like. You start with, uh, with a small hub, build some solar panels, then you expand it, you build some warehouse, uh, some tools inside, uh, then you build uh, greenhouses, domes, where you, uh, where you can put plants, and, uh, and ultimately you build basically a city on Mars and you experience it firsthand. So here are some, uh, some game arts from our game uh, and here are some screenshots. So you are playing uh, first person or, or third person. Uh, you can select how you want to start. So here you can see a landing capsule in which you, can, you have your var various tools uh, which, which are necessary to uh, to start building a base. So there is some uh, drill for uh, drilling rocks and uh, collecting resources, pipes and cables, uh, fire extinguisher for some, uh, you know, internal uh, fires. Uh, there is a blowtorch for welding parts. There is a spectral detector, what we call. Uh, we, use, we use it to detect what minerals are inside rocks and uh, where, where to find water. For example, there is a seed tool for planting seeds. There is a grinder for like destroying uh, buildings, retrieving resources. We also have air pressure tool for cleaning solar panels, for example. And yeah, so basically that, that's how the game looks like inside the base. Uh, we have uh, a lot of content in the game. Uh, while working on it, we were we had to research basically how uh, how such a base should should uh, basically what's needed to build a base on Mars when you only have basic resources, basic tools. So we we started basically from scratch, and and the game kept growing and growing. So right now we have multiple vehicles, as you can see. Um, there is a heavy rover, which is uh, like the, the most important vehicle because it's used to carry 
resources to the 3D printer. You, ha you can have different trailers for like water tanks, oxygen tanks, methane. Mm. Uh, you will be able also to fly uh, Ingenuity helicopter, um, drive uh, different uh, vehicles. There, is, uh, there are tens of different buildings you can build in to interconnect them. Uh, there are greenhouses, there are solar panels, power spritters, uh, tools like Workbench and HemLab. Uh, on the Workbench you are uh, learning basically soldering, fixing some uh, circuit boards, and in the chemistry laboratory you can uh, discover new elements and combine what you found on Mars to, to uh, basically discover new technologies. Uh, there are different big buildings like hangar where you can put your vehicles to uh, protect them for, from uh, sandstorms or, or meteors, for example. Um, the crusher or, or the shredder is the giant uh, building which is uh, used for processing the collected resources. Uh, you can build various antennas. Some are used to connect with like external uh, civilization and some antennas are used for uh, remotely controlling vehicles in the game. We also have robots, for example, this uh, for like robot which we call Spotty. Uh, uh, if you watched uh, a movie Red Planet many years ago, I think it was from 1997, there was also a four-legged robot on Mars. So that was our initial inspiration. Then we also were inspired by different companies who build such robots. Uh, you can also build uh, solid rockets, uh, liquid rockets. It's like a great way to learn <laughs> rocket science, basically. Uh, we have a rocket booster for going into Mars orbit. Um, and also uh, we have the what we call ITS for inter interplanetary travel, uh, where, uh, where you can uh, walk around inside it. We have a launch pad for it. And yeah, so basically we wanted to create the whole ecosystem of uh, tools, buildings and vehicles uh, to enable players to like basically um, fulfill their dreams on Mars. Whatever you want to do on Mars will should be possible in our game. And uh, it was cool that you mentioned uh, importing some uh, NASA height maps from real NASA, uh, from real Mars locations scanned by NASA. So we are also doing something similar in our game. Uh, we have some of the most known locations like Valens Marineris, uh, Olympus Mons, uh, some craters like Gale Crater, Jezero Crater, Korolev Crater. And between them, we are using uh, algorithms to generate uh, procedural terrain. So basically, the terrain is uh, um, procedurally generated, unlimited, and between those procedural like uh, uh, deserts and canyons, there are those well-known locations which uh, which we know from, uh, for example, the places where uh, real Mars rovers landed. So we also had to add uh, the things which were uh, where, where we didn't have enough detail in the NASA databases. So the, as, you, as you mentioned, fist-sized rocks. So we were also, for the last year, we were reworking basically our terrain system to, to support um, a lot of uh, different rock, size, rock sizes and to make it uh, run smoothly and uh, optimal on, the, on a typical plier PC. So, that's another thing. Uh, while working on the game, since we are working on it for over four years now, we prepared uh, some different arts, uh, like posters uh, from the game content, uh, which you can see right now. Uh, so uh, we really wanted to capture the, the spirit of uh, building the first base on Mars. We were inspiring, inspired basically by many companies who work towards this goal of creating a civilization on Mars and based on the most probable technologies which are currently being developed we we extrapolated uh, those technologies and and uh, created uh, the 
technologies of the future in our game. So it is science fiction, but it is hard science fiction. So we try to be as close to science as possible. And uh, there are there is no there are no fantasy elements. There is no uh, nothing uh, not, no uh, basically living organisms on the planet aside from uh, the dangers uh, which Mars has already. So so weather dif different weather conditions and uh, you can all, you can even uh, fall down and break your helmet and lose oxygen this way. So uh, we really tried to show as many uh, details as possible in the game and yeah so we also have some uh, funny achievements where you will be able to uh, collect while playing so yeah we we try to first and foremost make this uh, fun experience and we try to balance between uh, between fun and uh, realism because this is the most important to uh, to, to make it a su successful product. And if we make it successful, if we enable players to uh, create content for the game, uh, like using Steam Workshop or other modding tools, then the game would live on long after we finish it. And uh, people will still be talking about colonizing Mars. And that's very important. So uh, this is what we want to achieve, to achieve a place where people can uh, go back uh, years later to to feel like they are on Mars to do whatever they want on the red planet, and uh, yeah, and just uh, learn how how the future uh, colonies uh, would look like. So basically, uh, I hope you saw all my. Uh, uh, all, everything I, I showed you so far on the screen and um, yeah yeah it looks great either are, thanks if there are any questions i'm happy to answer yeah absolutely we have a few um i wanted to ask sort of what's your timeline now for finishing out the game and are you planning on doing uh it's kind of two questions are you also planning on doing a an indiegogo or kickstarter campaign yeah we are thinking about it um, for now, our plan is to uh, finish the beta version of the game and open it uh, first to our most uh, engaged players on our, which are on our Discord server, and then um, open it to more and more people, so that we can test what they do in the game. As you saw in the documents uh, I shared uh, just moments ago, there is a lot of different mechanics, tools, and uh, vehicles, and all of them can interact with, with each other in an open world game. So uh, there is no way to predict what players will do with them. So uh, the only way to make sure that everything works as expected is uh, to invite players to start playing and see what's, what they find, see their feedback. And based on that feedback, we will, uh, we will uh, decide on the release date. So hopefully it's not long. Uh, as I said, we started the full-time development of the game in 2017. So it's already a few years. And uh, we think in, in a few months, the game would be, uh, would be going live. And That's we great. know that this is a very competitive market, uh, especially yeah, releasing games digitally these days. There is a lot of different companies. There is a lot of different ways to uh, basically have an entertainment uh, because this is for for many players who will play this game. It will be mostly entertainment. Of course, there are uh, people who are excited about Mars, and I know that those will. Those people will uh, are waiting for the game, no matter what they will be playing it. But we we need to make sure that we are targeting a wider uh, range of people, so people are not may, maybe don't care about Mars. They just care about cool games, survival games. But maybe they will become in maybe they will they will become interested <clears throat> in Mars in colonization after playing our game. So uh, this is our goal to to make the launch as good as possible because the launch day is the most important in this uh, uh, in this uh, basically yeah it is in this hard market so 
we are doing everything uh, to prepare as great as we can for the lunch day and then hopefully uh, a lot of people will will see the game and will start this movement of occupying occupying mars that's great that's great um question from dusty green is there a tech tree in the game or are all items available right away yeah so uh, actually there are multiple tech trees uh we have uh, we have uh, decided to divide them into different uh, tech trees because one was too big and hard to navigate so basically you have like uh, materials tech tree electricity uh, chemistry biology mm, and and one more I, actually i don't remember right now because yeah so uh, if you want to uh, for example unlock new technology like the kilopower reactor, the nuclear reactor, which is uh, inspired by the, the one NASA is developing right now. So it will give you uh, more, more energy for powering your base while not needing so much space as you know, you would have to build like 10 solar panels. So while you, you can, you can build only one uh, kilopower reactor and it, it would give, give you the same amount of power. So to to unlock the kilopower reactor, you have to unlock some technologies in the electricity tech tree. And each technology has different requirements. And uh, yeah, so uh, the game is pretty complex. One of the, as, uh, as many of you know, we have released a free demo version and a prologue version on Steam last year. So one of the most common uh, feedback from players was that uh, the game uh, seems to be too hard for some people, that uh, we need to add more tutorials uh, which explain the mechanics better. So that was one of our focus uh, during the last uh, few months. And so right now we are pretty confident that the tutorials are uh, smooth, smoothly um, inviting players to, to learn about all the mechanics. Uh, last week we were at EGX London a gaming event where we were showcasing for the first time the full early access build and gathering feedback from the players. And it was great to see that uh, this work has paid off because there was a lot of, uh, a lot of people just had fun uh, playing the, the game, building their bases, gathering resources and and that's that's what's uh, that's what's the most important to to give people fun joy and if they have good uh experience they will remember that mars is something worth uh, learning about maybe they will go to university they will become engineers and um, inspiring people by video games is something we believe in very uh, very deeply uh, as our whole, whole company, Pyramid Games, was founded around this, this premise that we want to edu educate people with video games. And uh, we we did this previously with Rover Mechanic Simulator. So our, our previous game where we had a very detailed Mars Rovers where players, by relaxing, by playing, like fixing them, uh, players can learn about every single detail of those rovers, every single uh, scientific instrument which is on the rover, uh, why is it there, what's the purpose, how, uh, what's inside of it, and how to fix it. And so after spending like 15 hours in a rover mechanic simulator, you can um, basically finish the game and become an expert on, in the rovers and then tell your friends that, you know, all those details. and. Uh, to learn something, th this this amount of knowledge, you would have to study hundreds of pages of NASA documentation for a long time. And if it's shown in this form of a video game, it's it, it becomes enjoyable. It's it's not it's not work anymore. It's just relaxing uh, activity while also giving you a lot of knowledge and information. So. This is what we did with our previous games, and this is what we want to do with Occupy Mars. Yeah, and your your previous game, Rover Mechanic Simulator, wasn't there a connection to our European Rover Challenge as well? 
Yes, so we are cooperating with European Rover Challenge uh, for the third year uh, this time. This year we also uh, started an online e-tournament uh, because due to COVID, uh, the European Rover Challenge uh, is now uh, in a hybrid form. So there are um, competitions in the real Mars yard, like a simulated Mars environment in a, a University of Technology in Kielce. And uh, student teams from all, all around the world uh, bring their own rovers and participate in these competitions. And during this uh, uh, during uh, these competitions, we are also running an e-tournament in our game, Rover Mechanic Simulator, where uh, players compete with each other in fixing Mars rovers. So basically, we are also trying to get a younger uh, audience uh, interested in the European Rover Challenge and in building rovers. So. For example, people from schools who uh, who were visiting European Rover Challenge in the previous years, and uh, now due to COVID, it's it's harder to do. Uh, so those people, those those young uh, people, can participate in such tournaments and get excited about building rovers and fixing them. Uh, there are always some prizes to win, like uh, keys to video games, for example. And the main prize is driving a real rover on the Mars yard uh, remotely by uh, by internet connection. So this year, uh, a guy from Bangladesh uh, won the competition, and he couldn't uh, he couldn't fly to to Poland for the European Rover Challenge, but he could take part in our tournament online and. And you know, uh, this way he could uh, participate and yeah, and and got his prizes. So yeah, we are looking forward to the next year's European Rover Challenge. Uh, we we are planning some even bigger competitions, perhaps in Occupy Mars as well. So we want to 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 expand this esport um, without like esport without violence but uh, eSport with uh, focused on learning and focused on, on Mars. Yeah, I think the world needs a lot more entertainment uh, choices that are educational and not violent. That's great. Um, Robert, I see you're on video. Do you have a question for JSEC? You're on mute, Robert. Here, let me help you out. Okay, uh, well, how can people uh, join the game? I put yeah, the so link to the I put the link to your Steam page uh, and also the prologue in the chat. Mm -hmm. But go ahead, Jason. Yeah. So for now, there are multiple options. Uh, first, uh, if you want to join the full version of the game, the best way is to add your add our game to your Steam wish list. Uh, this way, you will get notified about uh, the start of beta and start of uh, early access game. Uh, meanwhile, you can play the demo version and the free prologue version on Steam, which is showing a shorter story uh, happening before the full game. Uh, you can also play a Rover Mechanic Simulator on Steam and learn uh, to uh, build Mars rovers, fix them. So yeah, there are multiple ways you can you can play, but the most important thing is to add uh, Occupy Mars to your wish list. This way, you will get notified once we once we are sure that we've tested everything, that we have completed translations, because the game will be released in at least eight languages, and there is a lot of text to translate. Because, as I mentioned before, we have like five different technology trees, uh, many technologies in each tree. We also have a knowledge base inside the game, uh, which has an article about every diff every single building vehicle tool you can find in the game, uh, different locations, uh, weather events. Uh, so it's, it's, it's become like a huge database and uh, even preparing the texts for, for the game and translating them takes some time. But once we finish all that, you will be able to, uh, to, to play the full game. So adding to your wishes, it will give you the opportunity to make sure that you, you won't miss uh, the time when uh, when it's ready. And as I said, right now you can play the free prologue on Steam and Rover Mechanic Simulator on Steam. 
Yeah, it's been on my wish list for a long time, <laughs> even before you had it on Steam as an option for wish lists. Um, and I definitely recommend the prologue. It's a lot of fun to check that out. Uh, one more question from the Q&A panel from Kai Wen Lin. Besides the tutorial, will you have a quest system or crafting? Yeah, so uh, there are multiple tutorial scenes. In each tutorial scene, you're learning something different. For example, we've prepared a special big tutorial scene for learning electricity, because electricity is pretty big part of the game, and you have to learn how to yes, build solar panels, connect them, uh, build uh, transformers for energy, uh, proper cable management, and uh, uh, this is like pretty complex, but once you complete the tutorial, you understand how it works, and then you can power even even very big bases uh, inside the game. Uh, as for as for quests, we have the as I said uh, at the beginning, we will have the campaign mode where player basically uh, plays a story. So there is his character is arriving at the base, and then something happens, and he needs to survive. So uh, he will receive quests and sub, sub quests, which will guide him through through the game. So uh, just like uh, Matt Damon in the movie The Martian, uh, is, we wanted it to be exciting. So uh, if uh, if players want to play the campaign mode, they can have like a mo movie interactive movie experience, let's say. And if somebody wants to explore the game on his own, then the sandbox mode is, is for that, where you can select your starting location. For example, Korolev Crater, full of water ice. It's a great, great location to start uh, for, for building water wells. Uh, or you can select uh, Jezero Crater and find Perseverance Rover there, try to fix it, build a base around, around the crater. So. Yeah, in the free play mode, you can do whatever you want. Uh, at first, it's easy to, let's say, at, at first, it's not easy to survive. But once you die a few times in the game, you, you will become an expert. And this knowledge will will be also valuable once maybe in the future, some of our players will, will uh, fly to Mars. And once they are are really on Mars, they will know what to do because there are some things which, which can be trained uh, by playing the game, like uh, how to build airlocks, uh, like in an optimal way, um, how to how to um, how to build greenhouses uh, close to uh, water supply and uh, managing electricity, uh, managing CO2 scrubbing inside inside the base. So I think there is also some research to be is possible to be made while playing because uh, you can build a huge base in relatively short time and then play and uh, see uh, how long can you survive using those starting conditions and then change the starting conditions and try again. And this way, once uh, uh, when, when we finally arrive on Mars in real life, uh, we will have, you know, hundreds of trial and error uh, in our experience. So we'll know what to do. Awesome. Well, thank you so much, Jacek. We're out of time now. We have to move on to the next uh, speaker. But I am so excited about your project, and I can't wait to try it out when it's released. And we're, you're, you've been a great partner for us as well on Mars VR with our Indiegogo. So thank you so much. Thank you for participating tonight and we wish you the best of luck. Thank you very much. It's, it's a great honor to be here. Even it's uh, 4 a.m. here in Poland, but it was really worth it to to join and, and talk about the game with you. So thank you so thank much you for staying up to talk to us. We really appreciate it. <laughs> thank thank you. you. All right, go get some rest. <laughs> Or you can hang out if you want. So our next speaker, um, Eric Bethke. I don't know, Eric, are you on audio? I don't think you are right now. Um, so let me talk a little bit about Eric's project. It's also very exciting. Um, his game is called Million on Mars. And I don't, Robert, maybe you want to talk a little bit about it because you're, you're an advisor to that project. Um, I've posted about it a couple times today in our Attendify live stream. Um, our, about Million on Mars and kind of what 
the opportunity is right now for conference attendees where they can actually purchase the game and then send their receipt in and it the million on mars will send a donation to the mars society so uh robert did you want to talk a little bit about this since eric's still getting on well uh i think eric is more qualified to talk about it but uh, eric's a game designer and uh he's working with a team uh quite a team uh and they're trying to put together a, a game where thousands of people from around the world will be able to compete or work together to uh, come up with ways to uh, settle Mars and, uh, and, and take on all the different challenges that are involved in that. So uh, you know, without further ado, let's get Eric on, on the line here. Yeah, I'm trying to here. He is not joined audio right now. Eric, uh, you might want to drop and then rejoin Zoom. Robert, I'm going to mute you because I know Stroke is really excited to talk about uh, talk to Eric too. Um, Eric, if you can drop Zoom and then rejoin, I think your audio is not connected right now. If you can hear me. Oh, he's trying. Okay. You can also try to dial in if your computer audio isn't working. Um, I can email you the the details there that would help. So Jeff, while we're waiting for Eric to join, um, what did you think of uh, Occupy Mars? Well, firstly, it's beautiful, right? It, it looks like one of the most aesthetically pleasing games I've ever seen, I have to say, uh, especially from a STEM perspective. If, if anyone gets the chance, click the link that I think James, you put the link up there too. You're able to kind of see the engineering within some of these vehicles uh, really clever how they've done it ridiculous amount of work and to do so at a level that looks almost realistic it's so impressive so in my hat goes off to the jacek and his team it's incredible yeah i and i've been following jacek's project since they announced it um i think about three years ago um just the, the trailer they made where they have an astronaut with a SpaceX style suit on yeah. and like a robot dog, a, a robotic uh, assistant. Um, they're setting up their base very much looks like uh, our hab at the MDRS and kind of setting up the different modules. Um, just a great idea, a great um, example of telling the story of what we're trying to do at the Mars Society of yeah, Sally and Mars. One of the things I wanted to ask him, and I'll follow up with him later, but it's just, it looked like there was a lot of homages in there, right? Like you said, the base looks similar to MDRS. That that truck that he had looks very similar to the Tesla truck, right? <laughs> now, like, is that just coincidence? Or is he just so advanced that him and his team is to figuring it out? Or, or was it just like a, a subtle nod to other people involved in it? It's fascinating. Yeah, no, I think he, there's a little, couple little nods there. And also he's got the first version of the Starship, the ITS. Yeah, It's kind of like a scaled up Starship almost um, in the game. It's pretty cool. Let's see. Uh, I've sent Eric the details. I guess we're just going to stall for a little bit longer. So, hey, I, Raksha, I see you on. So Raksha is our new chapters coordinator. We just uh, appointed her this week. Uh, what did you think about these two projects you've seen so far? I really think they're great and thank you for having me as the new chapters coordinator. I'm so excited to see this new project, especially the VR of mass reality is really earning out great. I think the amount of level of interaction which has been set up in these two softwares are wonderful and it will definitely help us train a virtual set of analog astronauts in the near future. Yeah. No, it's it's exciting work and uh, especially uh, JSEC's project. You know, I think that's going to be a really popular game when it comes out. A lot of people and he's doing the right thing. He's timing it right so that it's going to be successful. They're doing a lot of pre promotion for it and they really want to hit that mass audience of, of people that are gamers that aren't necessarily the Mars enthusiasts that are, you know, part of our organization or ones that, that follow our projects, trying to appeal to the mass gamers out there. And that's a huge market. You know, the, the video game industry is bigger than the movie industry now uh, in the U.S. And so 
there's a lot of uh, there's a lot of dollars that can be made for the right project. And I think if they have one that's that strikes a nerve, um, then you know that's going to be a, a great success for him. So Eric, you're saying that you have no idea why you cannot join properly. Um, you, it might be your audio device on your computer. Um, you might try using your phone and just dialing in. I sent you the dial-in details. So. Um, and just to check, Eric, do you know the, the setting to change your audio? In the taskbar at the bottom, there's a little speaker icon. You can click on that and open that panel and it'll say what, what mic you're using. Yeah, he says he's, he's done that, so, okay. Um, so Robert, I know you have some things you wanted to, to go over. Maybe we should throw it to you while we sort out Eric's issue. Robert, is that okay? You're, you're on mute right now. Yeah. There you go. And let's see this one. I'm going to give you the spotlight. And we, what's happening here? Yeah. Um, okay. Well, uh, every year, we, Mars Society gives out awards to outstanding volunteers. And the first one I want to give is to Evan Plant Weir uh, for outstanding service and extraordinary work on the Red Planet Bound blog. Uh, to be specific, he's a writer and he's been writing a series of great articles making, uh, as it were, the case for Mars. And uh, his work's been outstanding. So he gets uh, the first award. Uh, the, another award is to Gail Mariani uh, for outstanding service as the Capcom of the Mars Desert Research Station. That is, uh, you know, people um, observe the crews in action, but the crews are reporting to our mission support group. And uh, the most active member of the mission support group is the CAPCOM. He's the person who communicates with the crew, he or she. And uh, Gail Mariani has done an outstanding job with that. Uh, the next award is uh, for uh, Bernard Dubb uh, for extraordinary work on the information technology management that supports the Mars Desert Research Station. Okay, so congratulations, uh, Bernard. Um, so the next award is to Isaac uh, Makaria uh, for outstanding work on the Kenya chapter formation and newsletter. We have a chapter in Kenya and uh, Isaac is responsible for making that happen. Um, the next award is to Sagar Dhaka for outstanding uh, service and extraordinary work on Mars Society South Asia and the India Rover Challenge. You know, the Mars Society, uh, everyone has heard about the University Rover Challenge and many people have heard about the European Rover Challenge that was set up uh, by the Polish Mars Society. Well, we now have one in India and Sagar uh, has uh, played a leading role in that. Uh, then there's to K. Radzik, for outstanding service and extraordinary effort, co-leading the work each year at the Mars Desert Research Station. Um, the uh, Shannon Rupert uh, is, is the director of the Mars uh, Desert Re Research Station, but Kay Ratzik is her very capable uh, number two and uh, does a hell of a job. And then um, that's it. And look, you know, the Mars Society is, um, composed uh, of volunteers, the people who do all these things, that write these articles that uh, take part as crews in the Mars Desert Research Station that support them in mission support or, or take part in the work parties. That they're all volunteers, but there's a lot of things we got to pay cash for. Uh, you know, the equipment at the Mars Desert Research Station, the people that supply it, they need to be paid. Uh, this conference is costing some money. Um, we're not charging for it, but if you can give, please do. And there's a link uh, at the conference uh, uh, website uh, for donations. So uh, we're not charging people, but if you can give, please do, because, uh, you know, as uh, we'll give them hell, you give us the stuff, as the World War II. 
fundraising posters. Yeah, and I'll put the link to donate in the chat, um, Robert. And we definitely, like Robert said, you know, a lot of us worked hard for this conference to put this conference on. We're, we're giving away the tickets for free this year, but we still hope that you can send in a small donation to help our organization and our programs. We didn't, we didn't stop for COVID. We kept going, you know, and so we, you know, anything you can help us with would is much appreciated. So it yeah, looks like we, Eric's here. Yeah, we, we have Eric now. So, hey, can you hear me? Uh, yeah, we can hear you, Eric. We could see you. Great. Gonna, I don't. I have no idea what happened. I uh, I relaunched Zoom. I think about eight or nine times until it worked. Yeah. Well, we're glad you're here. Um, so, Eric Bethke, you are the CTO of Million on Mars, and we'd love to hear more about that project. It sounds. It looks so exciting to me, and. You've done some really innovative things with NFTs, I see. So tell us all about it. Thank you so much. Um, let me see if I've done the uh, sharing part correctly. Yes. Oh, That's fantastic. Good. Fantastic. I think my IT luck has hit its bottom and it's coming back. Um, OK, first of all, I just got to say I'm a little flustered by how long it took me to connect. So thank you. And I apologize to everybody. And I thank you for your patience. Um, and then I also have to say, it is just such an incredible honor to be here to uh, share Million on Mars with you guys, not just share it with you, but de debut what we're doing and to do it here at the Mars, uh, Mars Society Conference. I, I have goosebumps. I mean, I can't believe it. I mean, there's so many good talks. We've got, you know, Dr. Stroker, Chris McKay, folks I've seen in the literature going back decades, back to when I was a, uh, a student, um, an amazing talk on space nukes. Uh, Dr. Putzig and with um, water ice underneath Mars. Like I, I am just on fire with just how many awesome, amazing talks there are, and how much I'm getting out of it. Um, you know, and then, um, and then I also have goosebumps thinking back a year ago um, to last year when this happened. How can the Mars Society help you? Well, for there to be a self-sustaining city on Mars, there's two sets. Desire to go to Mars and can afford to go to Mars. When that intersection of sets reaches a million, roughly, then I think we will have this a city on Mars. We need both the means and the way. One the will and the way. The will and the way, yes, exactly, the will and the way. <laughs> when there's a will, it's way, but in this case, we need will and a way. Uh, so when the will and the way intersect, then we will have a we have all the planet species. I just loved it. I, I just loved how Dr. Zubrin helped him get that crisp and get it across the line. And so, I feel this. I feel so passionate about the need to, to broaden this vision and, and recruit people, as Dr. Zubrin was saying in his opening comments, how science fiction was the, the initial recruiter uh, from the rocket scientists 100 years ago. Um, the, the way I think that, that we could help uh, spread the vision and recruit the most people um, is via games. Um, in particular, I believe in massively multiplayer online games. And then, but why games? Why games? Now, obviously this is a panel on digital entertainment. So some of you folks are, are very familiar with this, but I wanna point out that games do make an awful lot of money. They make uh, more than TV, and uh, uh, more than uh, film and music combined. Um, and then they're second only to TV at the moment. TV, especially episodic TV is making tons of money. Uh, over $200 billion a year. But interestingly, TV skews very old. Um, you know, if, if folks over 65 are doing the bulk of the hours, young people are at one, one fifth the time uh, spending uh, on TV. So, you know, TV has peaked, it's on its way down. Games are definitely on, it, on the ascendancy. And for a scale, when you talk about market caps or market sizes, it's sometimes nice to reference other things. Um, and it's fun to see that our space industry is $350 billion um, and uh, it's projected to grow uh, quite, a lot, uh, quite a lot larger than we saw from uh, Dylan Taylor's talk, um, but also semiconductors in this size too. So yes, lots of money, lots of attention, but why to make a game about spreading the vision is not about the money. Um, and it's not even that about you know, trying to get a big share of the consumer's mind, mind share. That's not the point either. I feel extremely passionate about games. Um, 
because they honor the player. They put the player right there at the center of it. It's the player, um, you know, like they say about the best novels, the best novels is when the, when the author doesn't write too much exposition, when the, when, the, when the reader is able to paint the room, when the reader is able to create the characters in their mind and hear their own voices. There, there is a, a two-way beautiful thing that's made every time a reader reads a novel. I love that. But in my, you know, in, in my, what gets me really excited is that games take that to the next level where the player is also creating the protagonist and then also decides what the plot is going to be as well as filling out all the expositional bits. Um, so I think games are just super important. Um, I, I, I'm, I'm, I just couldn't underscore, underscore enough how important games are in terms of giving agency to the player to really experience these worlds. And then when you take them and you make them multiplayer, then it's all these other, all these people all making their own plot lines, all making their own characters and doing it together with each other in a world. And then if you make that multiplayer world online and you make it persistent, then you have a world. And then you can, and then you can really pull, it, pull the future of Mars forward and have people really experience it. Okay, a little bit about ourselves. I am just so, so humbled and so happy to be working with these folks. Uh, first, Carrie Waters. This is my partner and my CEO. Uh, we met in the last couple of years together. I had this deep passion about Mars. I'm geeking out about games. Turns out she is in the middle of writing a book about Mars, also about a positive future. And, you know, she's a very accomplished entrepreneur. The last thing she did is she built a, uh, a smart home water leak detection device that used machine language learning to learn how your, your particular home consumes water. And it could figure out if you had a leaky toilet or if you had, you know, a shower going on too long. And she did great things with that, successfully exited that business. Another one of my founders is uh, Joel Petros, consummate full stack engineer, um, far beyond just software, he can do hardware as well. Um, excellent at scaling uh, multiplayer systems. Um, just a pleasure to work with. Like literally, literally every one of his pull requests that he turns in, it's fun for me to read. Um, and I'm tickled to work with Mitch Zamar again. He and I worked together at Zynga about a decade ago, but it doesn't feel like a decade ago. Uh, and he's our lead designer on our blockchain game, uh, Land Rush. And then we have a bunch of other cool folks here. We have Kyle and Max, uh, Max doing uh, dev, Kyle doing community management. Nicholas is doing a bunch of 3D art and our train, which I'm gonna be showing you. And Ali doing UX, community, uh, music, and video. And then we have some amazing advisors. Obviously it's a super pleasure, super humble, Oh my gosh, to have Robert Zubrin here uh, advising us. I mean, I've been reading his books going back decades. Um, so it's great. Um, we also have uh, Nicolo DeMossi. He's the uh, former CEO and chairman of Blue Mobile uh, with a successful exit of Electronic Arts. And Jeannie Edmonds, she's a fantastic and accomplished uh, TV producer and filmmaker. She's really thoughtful, really, really deep thoughts on narrative and, and getting the uh, culture right. And then Elizabeth Young uh, joins us from Hong Kong. Uh, she's an extremely successful blockchain entrepreneur and she's helping us uh, advise and, and navigate in that space. And here's a fun fo photo of our team. Um, this, this a little bit masks our team. We also have uh, a set of contractors and partners that we use across the, the process things that we're building. So our team is actually effectively quite a bit bigger than this. Uh, but here, here's our Austin based crew. And there's a local uh, local uh, cement truck that was abandoned from 80 years ago that we took this photo on and then mocked it up on, on Mars. Okay, so what are we really building? Uh, I told you a massively multiplayer online game. That's part of it. Um, what we what we're building is we we want to uh, also assist with the same efforts as Mars VR, Occupy Mars. We want to grow the Mars metaverse. We feel really passionate about bringing a far of, of bringing forward a positive vision of the future. We want people to feel great about the future. There's just so many different options for dystopias out there. There's, 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 there's reasons to feel glum about climate change. There's reasons to feel glum about wealth inequality. There's all sorts of problems out there. 
But we feel people need to have a positive vision of the future. And not only that we feel like they need it, you know, we believe intensely that it's through the settlement of Mars and settlement of the solar system that's going to unlock the technologies and the resources of the solar system to, to free humanity, to continue to grow and expand and prosper and thrive, and, and even bring back some relief on, on Mother Earth. We'll bring back technologies for, for Mother Earth, make it, you know, energy more efficient. We can make the agricultural system more efficient. I mean, if you think about it, everything you have to do to succeed living on Mars, apply that on Earth, Earth gets better. Like we, we have to get better at marketing how space is pro-Earth. Okay, so we're gonna do that, we're doing that with two games and a book. Uh, we're gonna spend bulk of my time today talking about Minomars, the 3D MMO on Steam, but I'll also speak a little bit about Land Rush, which we, both of these, we have just launched in the last three weeks. It's two games, but why would we do two games? Making games is very hard. I've been doing it for 26 years, so it's, it's challenging. Um, but why make two games? So let me first talk about Land Rush. Land Rush is our blockchain game. It's built on the Wax blockchain. It features non-fungible tokens. If you don't know what that means yet, it's kind of new stuff. It means that when you, when you own something in Land Rush, you really own it. And that record of you, of you owning it is written onto the blockchain record. It's like, it's like an open, transparent uh, database or spreadsheet ledger. And so with, with Land Rush, we're exploring the concept of actually owning your land, owning the buildings and structures in the land, um, creating creating jobs for other people to come to your land and, and do those jobs, and you go to other people's lands to do their jobs, and trading resources back and forth. So it's all about that hardcore, strong player run player run economy, um, and that's about what I'm going to talk about today on that one. And then on Million on Mars, the 3D game, the MMO. Well, that's where we try to get into what you guys are all about here at this conference. Um, I've been reading back, you know, cover to cover, both the Mars Colonies book and the Mars City States book. I love it. I love Nexus Aurora. I love the Coral of Crater contributions. There's so many great chapters in there, so many great systems. Um, and of course, I've read you know, Dr. Robert Zubin's books going back for years, you know. But, you know, when I'm, when I, when I was trying to teach my kids uh, a little bit about, you know, what a Mars base would look like, I, I would grab big, big sheets of graph paper and I would try to draw out these bases and I'd try to draw and show how big relatively the, the solar panels would, would have to be compared to the base. And then, you know, drawing, beautiful, great, but drawing, it's too tedious and too labor intensive. It's not good for simulations. So, we want to build, we are building a simulation where people can get into the institute manufacturing. We want them to figure out different strategies for, uh, you know, power generation. Is it going to be small nukes, big nukes, completely solar, hybrid? How do you have story energy? All this stuff we're putting in the game. All right. So that's an actual screenshot from in game. You see uh, a couple of starships in the distance. We've got some domes, some science labs, some solar panels. And here is the setup for the game. If the year is at 2042, and you have just completed a big fat business plan for what you would do to create a settlement on Mars. And your business plan has been accepted by a character we call Leon Dusk. Now, Leon, this Really impressed with the proposal. He's decided to back you with a billion dollars, but he's not giving you a billion dollars all, all, all up front. Instead, it's a bunch of tranche venture debt. So neatly, you're gonna have to finish a bunch of missions and, and make progress in order to get some of that cash. And eventually you're gonna to wanna to turn a profit and you're gonna to wanna to be able to you know, pay down your debt and be a fine upstanding a city state on Mars. You buy, you buy some uh, fast resources from Phobo Station, or you can get some slow resources from Earth. Um, and then you know, the focus of the game early on is on that early robotic phase where you're unpacking your rockets and setting up the core infrastructure and try, to, and, and try your best to prepare for the first 20 uh, NPC Martians. 
I've got a bit of a trailer to share with you guys. And so we just went into early access uh, three weeks ago, and this is a screenshot from one of our players. Um, I love this. I love this player, and I love his screenshot. You can see him organizing out his smelters. He's got his solar panels up on a little bit of a ridge. He's got some methane fuel cells, you know, water tanks, and storage. He's really geeking out, and he's found a, a, a couple different bugs for us. In fact, he found a bug for how you can summon some extra rockets before you should have should have been able to do that. So we got that uh, closed up um, from his contribution. Uh, this is actual uh, height map terrain from West Ladon's Valleys. Uh, uh, we do use uh, the high rise uh, data set and you the look at the terrain that you see you see here is the actual terrain on Mars. A couple more screenshots here. Um, Here's a high level overview of how we go about doing that. Um, we go into the high rise data set. We grab one of their uh, 3D eight, uh, digital train maps. We do some processing. We use some of our assets, some other engine assets. We, we do a little bit of proprietary sauce and put it together. And we create these hexagon plots that each player owns that are 250 meters on a side. And if you, you do the math on 250 meters on the side, it comes out very neatly to be 40 acres. So we like the joke of uh, 40 acres and a mule. Um, and it turns out that if you do that, if you do 250 meters on the side, each part gets 40 acres. Later on, they can buy some more land. Um, it turns out you work out to having 831 million plots of land on Mars. Uh, at this time, though, we're focused on just the land that's available inside the high rise uh, data set. Uh, and we have a, a fun little uh, cool thing where each piece of land is given um, a three word name. So on that slide there, you see uh, acorns, axioms, and allies. If you do that with three words and you have a thousand words each, you can cover a billion plots of land. That's just to help players uh, remember where the lands are and be able to jump around and visit each other. And here's another good look at, at the terrain. Um, and we're getting better and better at it. I, uh, Nicholas, uh, I mentioned to you on the team doing the train, I gave him a challenge um, a, a couple of weeks ago to take, take, a screen, take a photo from the Curiosity mission in, in the Gale Crater. I said, you know, using that photo, using the high rise data set, and then go ahead and do a little bit of custom work on some rock decorations, how close can you get? And this is where the leading edge of what our train is looking at right now. This this mount this image on the right is from from the in-game game engine, and this this is what it looks like and feels like when you play the game. And on the left was a source image. So I'm feeling really really excited about how how high a fidelity we're we're achieving here. All right, the crafting loop. The crafting loop. It's all about in situ crafting. I mean, it, if you boil the game down to it, is all about simulating the in-situ crafting. So how does that work? You have miners that go around scooping up a surface regolith. You've got um, little explorer type rovers that go around explore. They can build, they can repair, and they can do a little bit of light transport. But it's the miners that scrape that dirt off. They bring it to your, your arc smelter. Um, and a, a modeling arc smelter right now, there's some sort of differential arc smelter capable of processing different uh, uh, or, or is at different temperatures. And it processes it out, and you can stockpile uh, refined bits of uh, ignits, or you can go ahead and use them right away in some sort of manufacturing. Um, I was I was stoked 
uh, for uh, Dr. Putzig's uh, talk on uh, SWIM and finding out that he's got the GIST data set. So uh, right after this call, you know, after this conference, I'm going to follow up next week and to gather up that data set and I'm going to layer in that water ice to the best known values that we currently have and put them around the planet. Um, and I would love help. I would love help uh, getting models on how to distribute the different other minerals around the planet. And I want to continually iteratively use the current best science to keep updating the model and make it more and more close to uh, reality. Uh, here's another example of the crafting loop. You know, while the rovers are out there gathering regolith to try and make some metals for you, um, they're also going to be picking up some water-rich clays, and they're going to be picking up, ideally, some water ice, depending on where you landed. And um, then you could take that into a waterworks, and the waterworks would bake the clay and get the, you know, the water vapor out, and then condense the water vapor down, and you get some water, or it crosses the ice. Either way, you get to split that water into O2 and H2. And then with another machine, you cryogenically distill the atmosphere and get out some CO2 snow. Alternative to that, there's probably a couple other methods that we could use to get uh, the CO2 out, like maybe some sort of like microchannel method. And so using the hydrogen from the, from the split water and the carbon dioxide, you run everybody's favorite process, the Sabatier process, and you make methane. And with methane, of course, you guys know you're off to the races with rocket fuel, a plastics industry. And even uh, earlier in the, in the talk today from the Korolev crater guys, talking about how you can uh, just make food. Uh, so everybody loves methane. Okay. I can't be a domain expert in all these things. My team can't be a domain expert in all these things, on all these different techniques. In fact, uh, we're not domain experts at any of this stuff. Um, we make games. In a previous life, I did drop out of my PhD in, uh, in aerospace engineering, and I did work at the Jet Propulsion Laboratory, and I had a brief tour of duty on the Galileo and Cassini UV spectrometers. Um, but I am not a rocket scientist. I'm not an, a practicing scientist. I, I, I can read a science paper, or at least I think I can, um, but I am not a domain expert. But what we do is we model all the recipes in the game as to taking four inputs, and you can have up to four outputs, and, the, and it uses time, and it uses energy, and it uses tools, and a skill level and then it outputs something. And the output is either another intermediatory resource or some sort of final polished good. You know, so, so based on this model, I had a fun conversation with Dr. Robert Zuma a couple of weeks ago, and we were talking about um, solar power and nuclear power. And I, know, I knew he was loving to talk about nuclear power. He's been a, a big proponent of nuclear power in space for a long time. He's got a degree in nuclear energy. So it was really easy for me to tee that up and say, hey, hey man, can you help us out? And, and uh, give me some direction on how, how, how would nuclear power look like at a high level, at a systems level? And uh, so he, he gave us you know, a rule of thumb starting off with, a, with the uh, 100 kilowatt watt reactor, to get the mass at 4,000 kilograms. And then we worked out on some prices and guessed some things out. And then he's also a, a big fan about thinking about fusion reactors in the future. So we, go, we went ahead and created three uh, fusion reactors as per his uh, high level direction here. Um, so if there's any mistakes in here, the mistakes are all mine. If there's anything great in here, the greatness is from him. That's a good way to keep, keep track of that. Um, but I had fun too, because then we had Dr. Uh, Poston from Space Nukes, the guy that actually made you know, Krusty and Duff, he's giving his talk on Space Nukes. And then from the formula that uh, Zuber gave me, I was, I was running Krusty 10K at 1,295 kilograms, but uh, Dr. Uh, you know, Poston had 1,500 kilograms. So I updated it and I updated it in the game um, right during the talk. Um, so that's what I mean. We can't be domain experts and everything. We want people to tell us what we're wrong about and, and just we'll fix it and then we'll make it better. And I want to make it better with, with everybody. Um, you know, in anything you do in a crafting game and a survival game, um, it's fun to have things break down and repair. Uh, here's an image, set of images down the bottom of myself and my two sons. We were extremely fortunate. Um, I took a three-year sabbatical off from work, and we went sailing. Um, and when we were out sailing, what that really breaks down to is, is fixing the boat in exotic locations. And that, that, that really sticks in my mind a lot in thinking about um, settling Mars. You know, 
we're going to we're going to need systems that are super reliable, super modular. There's a lot of other experts who gave terrific talks on that. But how we're modeling that in the game is that each object has a real reliability rating and then a durability rating. The reliability is like how 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 many cycles going to have before if, if it even had a chance to have a breakdown. And durability keeps track of kind of its health points for that object. If it gets down to zero, it's it's completely broken, needs to be repaired. Um, we need help on this too. Uh, on each of the different systems, uh, we need help on talking about what would be the reliability and the durability of an aeroponic system versus um, you know a, a a space nukes mostly solid state nuclear reactor, you know versus um, you know, a, a saboteur reactor. So you need help uh, on sourcing these numbers, getting them better and refining the simulation. Uh, same thing with the food food and uh, food production system. Like there's so many good talks here, um, but I wanna get this right. You know, I would like to get, I would like to turn into like black box values for what would be a silkworm tab setup. You know, we, I've, I've heard we can do a lot of wonderful things with silkworms. We can get some proteins. We can also get, you know, silks and fabrics. What does that look like from a high level? Like four inputs, four outputs, energy, time, tools, resources, skills. And then I could break it up and I could put it into the game. Uh, one thing we don't model is, uh, is, is, is thermodynamics and temperature. Um, and I would enjoy having a debate on the side with somebody else about that. But, you know, at, at, while we, was, while we strive to be very rigorous and very in, in depth and we wanna be as, as realistic as possible of engineering science, we do, we do cut the corners a couple places. Uh, and one place is, not, is by not modeling a thermodynamics. But another place uh, where, we, uh, you know, where we cut the corners a little bit is time. You know, we run the simulation at a 30 to one ratio. So every hour that you play the game, 30 hours, uh, passes on, on Mars. And that's, and that's gotta be true because, you know, if you just had to sit there and just watch a tomato grow or watch uh, Matt Damon's potatoes grow, that would take too long. Uh, but 30 to one is still a fairly uh, long period of time. It still feels rigorous. And one of the things that is really neat is, um, so night, night on Mars is, is meaningful. It, it lasts about 45 minutes long. And so the way we set up the training mission it is roughly a bit like Minecraft, where Minecraft starts you off and says, hey, you got to build shelter before night comes. We do that as well. We, we do take a moment, we pause time at eight o'clock in the morning local time, and we guide you through the experience of getting your core energy systems up, up and, and wired in just for the first, first night. And then you can use things like a methane fuel cell to get, get yourself some on-demand uh, power in the middle of the night. So we, we tweak a little bit with time but I'm really proud of our use of time. Um, it's very rare in a massive multiplayer game for time to be that impactful um, as it is in our game. Um, then we need more help on, you know, habitation systems. Like there are so many wonderful talks on architecture and there's so many different choices. We've got, we've got you know, inflatables, we've got geodesic domes, you've got lava tubes, you've got shields, all that kind of stuff. I would love to incorporate everybody's ideas from all these different chapters. And I'd love to get our 3D artists to go model them and create them and put them in game. I need numbers on mass. I need numbers on time to make and lots, lots of details, but I wanna hear from everybody and keep making it um, more and more robust. And I'd like to unlock uh, you know, everybody to go out and build their own settlements and have their own vision of how this, how this works out. And, and let's, let's see it. And then here's where it gets really cool. And, you know, by being a persistent server, massive multiplayer online game, this is one Mars. It's one analog Mars, one super analog research station, uh, a digital one. And we get to figure out like, okay, at the high level, at the economic systems level, what's it gonna take? How, many, how much in situ resources and how much trade back and forth? How, where do we need to go to get to break even? Um, and that's, that's the heart of this company. That's, that's, that's where the, the name itself comes from, Million on Mars. That was a phrase that's been kicked around for a while. I, I, I most often think of about it with Elon Musk. I don't know if he was a true originator of that term. Um, but the question is, how many people is it going to take for us to have a, a self-sustaining economically 
uh, settlement on Mars. And so we can try that. We can try that now. We can have players go build out these systems. We could go have them build out their settlements. They can have a ton of fun while they're doing it. And then we can collect all that data and we can kind of sort some things out. I'm not going to claim that we're going to end up having something like truly, you know, rigorous and really a, a proof of this, this, you know, of the accuracy here. But um, it should be at least directionally very interesting. All right. Um, I'm conscious about how much time I've taken, so I'm going to try to go a little bit quicker for you guys. Um, but we need help on like, hey, what about what about if we just sent you know um, thin film uh, solar cells and didn't send the glass and didn't send the frames? And then what if there was a machine that was already there, uh, not a machine that was already there? What if the player you know levels up to the tech tree, gets to the point where they can uh, uh, go and 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 melt down the, the, their own uh, glass and, and make their own frames? That would save you know 95% of the mass of throwing solar around. That could be really interesting. So we, we should test that out. This is really cute. I wanted to show you here. Um, these are actually the first two versions of Million on Mars. One on the left has version one, one on the right, version two. These were both done in Python. They were done uh, by myself and my two sons when we were out on that sailing trip. And we prototyped the game and I got it to be pretty fun. And this is what caused us to stop sailing, come back to Austin. Uh, meet up with Carrie and Joel and, and get this company going. Um, Carrie's writing the novel. I'm super excited about this. This is another thing I'm really proud about with our, our MMO is the year starts in 2042. We have real characters with a plot line. And as I said, time goes 30 to one. There's going to be events in the game that are impactful and meaningful across the whole planet and, and carries the plot line forward and gives some structure to the game. All right, I have an ask. Uh, I would really, really appreciate you guys going to Steam, purchasing our game, it's $14.99 on Steam. Uh, the way it works, Steam takes 30% of it, and we're gonna give five bucks to uh, the Mars Society for every copy sold, and we've guaranteed a bunch of copies up ahead, we've already paid ahead. Um, and the way that works out that, you know, if you do the math, you know, the Mars Society even gets more money than we do out of it. But the money's not the point. Money is not the point at all. We want the feedback. I want everything I talked about above. I want to figure out how to drive more and more of those resources to be more correct. I want more and more recipes in the game. We have 200 different craftable recipes now. We have over 200 objects you can make. Um, I want more. I would like to see 1,000, 2,000, 3,000, and I want them to be really rigorous and fun. And, and the burden's on us to make it fun, but I want, you know, I want the accuracy and the data first. Um, Beyond that, of course, I want you to play the game and just tell me what, you know, what sucks. And, and then I also want to hear more about, you know, uh, especially the player to player part. It's exciting to talk about politics and, and uh, how are people going to organize themselves on Mars. I don't want to come across and impose a particular governmental organization on the players. I want to instead give them the tools so they can go off and, and build their settlements as they see fit. And we can see some sort of that freedom engineering and, and uh, see some different possibilities. All right, um, thank you. Thank you very much for allowing me to be here. Thank you very much for tolerating my uh, inaptitude when it comes to Zoom. I was sweating that hard um, and we're hiring. Uh, we want more people to join our team and help us grow this. Thank you so much, Eric. This is such an exciting project. I am in love with this project you're doing. <clears throat> I want to tell you, um, I actually used to play Starfleet Command. I, I played Starfleet Battles when I was in high school, like the pen and paper version of that. And the first time I played Starfleet Command, I was like, oh my gosh, I could play an entire battle in like 20 minutes, something that would take me like hours to do. Uh, I just, sorry, I had to geek out and just tell you that I, I was, I've been a fan of yours, uh, your work for a long time, so. Thank you very much. Thank you, I just got that. Yeah, that gave me some goosebumps and chills. Yeah, I, I loved working on Starfleet Command. And I was really, um, thank you, I'm really proud of that particular piece of work because Starfleet Battles is one of the most beautiful board games ever, but it takes freaking forever to play. Right. Um, I have a couple, we have a couple questions for you. I, I wanted to ask first about, you mentioned that you have this MMO version of Mars that's sort of like a one big analog that you're constantly adding data to. 
Can you talk a little bit about what the research possibilities for that might be when that is fully formed? And I mean, I could imagine be, having researchers be able to use that as a test bed for various things. Absolutely, absolutely. I, I, um, I can tell you what I hope and I, and I dream, um, and I don't want to come across as sounding arrogant, but literally all of those proposals there are submitted to the Mars Society, every little bit of them, I would like to be able to optionally allow those creators to, to, to put it in there. You know, people are suggesting different size, you know, nuclear reactors, and some people are having different buildings, build them, put them in the game, and then collect all the stats from all the players. What, what, what resources are they collecting from the regolith? And then, and then continually, iteratively, again, update that regolith model update the, the drilling model and, and keep sharing what, what are the uh, aggregate production values as well as the discrete ones from a particular settlement and, and share that data with researchers and, I, and have people go, look, wow, gosh, there's a, there's a really weird, Here, here's what I'm thinking. I, this, is, this is totally speculation on my point, my, my point of view. But I think that, that getting you know, 20 to 100 people there will make some kind of sense and you can do it and then you can spend you know x number of billions of dollars you know private and public and it makes some sense but i think there's going to be a, a hard uncanny valley you know somewhere between the 500 to 2000 person where it just gets really tough to figure it out and then after that it starts to get easier again but what i'm hoping is by building out the system and everybody play oh and here's a really important part it's really important that people own their land and that they really own their settlement and they and they and they love it because then then they have that engagement and that passion to go build it out and grow it. And it's important that they can see the other people nearby and they can go visit and 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 in a, in a friendly way compete and share ideas. But then yes, share that data, and we can kind of see um, um, a little bit of a roadmap. And behind you, James, I think you have a pert chart of a. Uh, of, of, of a space plan, right? That's the integrated space plan. That's right. Yes. Yeah. I've been looking for that poster for a while. I lost mine. I, I want to get one again. I but can I'm put you in touch with the folks that work on it. Yeah. Oh, that'd be great. So what I'm hoping is that, that this game itself becomes an integrated space plan uh, realized it, you know, interactively and virtually with people. And, it, and it's, it's hard to describe with words, but I'd like to have a much better version of that chart. That's fantastic. Um, tell us a little bit about your timeline and your release pipeline. So the game you have on Steam, the, the sort of computer game, is one release. The Land Rush blockchain is another. Are you working on, are you, are you going like, to, tell, tell us a little bit about how that's going to work long term um, and, and any other products you might think be thinking about. Sure. Um, I'm not going to read this slide to you. I'm going to leave this up while I'm talking over it at the higher level. We're going we're gonna to complete both of those experience, experiences over the next year. Um, complete meaning right now on the Steam game, you're dealing with rovers and robots, um, and you're dealing with that early setup phase. There are no NPC Martians there, and you, the player, are realized uh, uh, in a command drone. So no, no, there's no life support systems yet, um, and no, no bio needs yet. That's, that's planned for Q2 next year. Um, or perhaps a little bit earlier. Um, but we want to get the core systems complete about the rovers and storage and the linkages between the factories and a steel system, get people to really be able to do it, you know, Every player gets their own piece of land right now, as I spoke about, uh, but we have another feature uh, coming up where you'll go around and be able to pick out uh, you know, multiple plots of land and make larger larger sections or, or have bases in, in a couple different places. Um, so it's about finishing the fidelity of this institute crafting and the fidelity of this of this um, business sim too. You're you're a business as well as a settlement. That's just one vector. Um, and on the land rush side, it, it's also about the same sort of thing. Um, but that one's uh, web and it's mobile. This is a hardcore desktop PC, so we cover we cover all the major platforms. Um, finish out the blockchain gameplay and really prove out that play to earn um, model 
this is a really new model in the game industry. Um, I'll, uh, I should probably spend a moment talking about it. Um, I moved to South Korea in 2003 when the item-based model was brand new. The item-based model, we, we all know now, it's free to play. You go buy microtransactions and you're off the races and you do lots of wonderful things in terms of enabling people to play for free, try it, if they like it, they, they buy more. Now the play to earn model is coming along now on a blockchain game where people could via their own play and via their own engagement, they could they can contribute to the game by being socially rich and time rich. And then they can actually um, earn, earn, earn currency in, in, in a cryptocurrency. And that cryptocurrency in, in turn can be um, you know, withdrawn out to a, a fiat currency. So there's this new paradigm shift that is, that is going to revolutionize games. Five years from now, my prediction is blockchain will be under the hood of almost all games. Um, I, I even wrote a book back in 2008 where I was very critical of the end user license agreements in games where I thought it was ridiculous that people have backpacks and swords and castles and you tell them that it's theirs and you get them all excited about that and you have them play for 2000 hours and pay you a bunch of money. But at, at a, a flick of a switch, you can just you know disconnect them and say, no, nope, you violated our terms of service. Um, we're going to rip all your stuff away from you. In my opinion, I, 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 I see that as a... Uh, human rights violation, a property rights violation. So I'm, I'm intensely interested in the liberty, strong liberty, strong ownership um, prospects from blockchain. So that's what we're gonna do on Land Rush. And then both of these games, I'm gonna start recognizing each other in the metaverse, meaning assets in Land Rush and assets in Millennium Mars are recognized in either, in either game. There's benefits to players, there's reasons why you wanna acquire um, if you wanted to unlock, for example, one of Zubrin's uh, fusion reactors, you're probably gonna have to uh, play a bit in Land Rush and then you can get it over there. And so we'll build out our, our bit of a metaverse here. And then, uh, and then of course, the natural idea is to, uh, is to combine these two. Um, one question from Rick K. He says, it's interesting to see Python code being used in some of your early prototypes. Does that have anything to do with the recipes? And will participants and players be able to write their own recipes? That is a fantastic question. And I'm so glad you asked me that question. Um, it turns out that the, the core crafting on, um, is, still in, is still being used today when it translates our, um, our, our spreadsheets that contain we have a spreadsheet dedicated to each of the resources, a spreadsheet for all the missions, a spreadsheet for all the recipes. Uh, we use Python still to do the translation and then bring it into the database. And then to your question, an editor, that's the holy grail. That's what I'd really like to do. And that's why I'm throwing it out here. And that's why we're debuting here at the Mars Society Conference. Depending how much feedback I get from folks and how much interest I get from folks, we'll invest in an editor and we'll invest in the ability for people to um, more rapidly iterate out uh, new recipes and resources in the game. Excellent. Um, one more question. Let's see. Uh, Dusty Green asks, when you start out in the game attached to the main colony, do you then get your own land and equipment once you have enough money? Right. Um, we're actually a, we're actually a little bit more generous than that. We will we do um, give you a temporary lease to the land you're at, and you you get one one chunk of money to start with you get some uh starting items and we walk you through a fatui sorry first time user experience um and then there are there is a quest chain and a, ta uh, a set of tasks you need to do to, to truly own your land and then you can uh, and and continue to earn more cash to get more supplies mm -hmm. what engine do you use to model martian terrain and objects in game so um it's a mixture of stuff it's it's Again, we use uh, starting off with a high raise data set. We bring it through some scripts that we wrote. We process it in a, in a couple different intermediate arrays. Um, and then we bring it into Unity as the overall uh, main game engine. And then there's an asset uh, called Map Magic that we're fond of. That was a screenshot of it back up here. Oh, you're not sharing right now, Eric. Sorry. Oh, I'm not. No, I'm sorry. OK. Um, I showed a screenshot of, of Matt Magic's little graph-based node system, um, but my this this talk will be uh, shared, and I can I'm happy to share my deck too. Sure, yeah. sure. Um, 
Alexandros Lordos, who's one of our 2019 Mars Colony author co-authors for Star City, asks, in his design, he had worked on socio-behavioral challenges, personality development, and social cohesion on Mars. Do you see potential for simulating such issues through Million on Mars? Yeah, I, I do. I do. And I want more help on that, too. Um, our current design is each player will have the ability to command and control up to 20 non-player characters. And each of the 20 non-player characters will have a name, they'll have a bit of personality, they'll have skills, and they'll have morale, and they'll have health. And then it's up to the player to grow those little NPC character skills and make sure that they maintain their morale. So food, you know, fresh food, food diversity, safety, um, you know, if there is a if there's an accident and, and, uh, and an NPC gets, you know, maimed, injured or killed, they'll have a uh, it, it'll have a spread of negative morale to the other ones. Um, and they might vote with their feet or at the very least, their productivity goes down. And uh, I would welcome I, I would welcome more feedback and discussion on how to make the model on the NPCs more interesting. And that's why consciously we're, we didn't not did not launch with them first. We first wanted to lock in. The core crafting systems and loops, and then focus on the uh, on the uh, the human modeling. What advice do you have for young game designers? Ah, I have something really specific. Um, find a great game, and font, and then write the game design document for that great game. Um, I literally mean that. I call it a reverse design document. In my opinion, writing a game des design document is two different skills at the same time. One, you're having to be creative and create a brand new game. And two, you have to write it and document it and share that with other people. If you wanna be a game designer, it doesn't matter how cool your idea is if you can't communicate it. And so rather than burdening yourself with the burden of learning how to write a design document and trying to come up with a, a great game, just wipe out one of those requirements and just pick an already great game and then screen by screen, by action by action, control by control, monster by monster, or weapon by weapon, however it is, dissect it, tear it apart, and write it, and see if, see if a buddy of yours can read your writing and understand what to make. Okay, well, for our last question, we're gonna throw it to our room in Alt Space VR, and they're gonna ask you from there. <coughs> Go ahead. Hi, can you guys hear me? We can. Hi, my name's uh, Nathan. I, um, I'm a recent backer of the um, Land Rush project. I um, just want to tell you how excited I am about it as well. It's, it just looks absolutely brilliant. Um, my question is, you, you mentioned briefly before there was going to be some sort of relationship between the two games. Could, could you just expand just a little bit more on how that will work? Yes, yes. Um, so I'm going I'm to speak as precisely as I can about this. Um, very, very recently, yesterday, um, Steam um, rejected any game that's built on the blockchain or features NFTs. And right. I, said, I had very strong suspicion that they were going to do that. And so I will admit, I feel pretty smug and pretty smart that we have separated our, our two projects this way. I was like, ah, I'm sure Valve and Steam is going to have opinions. So, so let's just keep yeah. our blockchain learnings isolated in a particular swim lane. And then let's also go make our awesome in situ crafting game on Steam, right? Two extremely important vectors of learning and iterations that need to happen. And it would be a tragedy to, to have Valve roll over and I can't think of polite words, but I didn't, you know, I didn't want that to happen, <laughs> right? But, but metaverse, let's not just be metaverse with hands waving around the world. Let's actually be a metaverse, right? Right, so, so again, in Land Rush, you have land, you have buildings, you have workers, you have NFTs. I can look on the wallet, I can recognize that. And from that wallet, I can actually pop that into my, my database and recognize your status having that stuff. On the Steam side, I log in the, in the database and go, oh, well, okay, cool, check it out. James Burke has unlocked uh, fusion reactor technology because of the stuff he's done over there. Boom. And so I can start to stitch together recognition, meaningful oh, recognition. brilliant way of doing it. Yeah. And yeah. Then, and then, then when Valve and Steam looks at that, they're like, what are you doing? Are you doing any blockchain stuff? I'm like, no. 
<laughs> I'm doing metaverse stuff, dude. Come on, catch up. Yeah, they need to definitely 100. percent I um I, I sent you a message yesterday as well. It, obviously, I don't know if you I don't know if my full name came up or not, but you, you might know me in Discord as Nay the Horse. Um, oh yeah, Nay the Horse. Games okay, will know great. me by that as well through through obviously the Mars Coin yes. project, and I've been involved in that all year. And <laughs> I, I'm such such a big fan of everything. Like uh, I've been like really nerding it out recently on, on everything, and, and finding Million on Mars project just blew my mind. So well done to everyone. Everyone here, it's pretty surreal to be speaking to all of you guys, and obviously Robert Zubrin being here is just mind blowing. Um, yeah, overwhelming. Even though I'm on VR, I feel like I'm with you guys. It's really strange. Like, <laughs> you are totally with us it. right I now. Loving it. Yeah, <laughs> I feel it. I feel it. Oh, you just came on really big on the screen in front of me now as well, uh, James. Yeah. So, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Well, thank I, I'm, you. Go I'm ahead, blown man. away. I'm blown away too, man. It's just so awesome to be here and 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 just listen to all these amazing sessions and to think that I have a chance to sit here and, and, and share some of them back. That's uh, amazing. Balls. Well, Hey Eric, um, this is an incredible project. We're huge supporters. We're going to be huge supporters of this and your success. Um, one last question. If someone wanted to be a founder, um, how could they do that? I know that's an option as well for folks. Oh yeah. Thank you. Um, yeah. If you want to be a founder, Probably the easiest thing to do is to, to pop into our Discord channel and we can walk you through the steps. To be honest, blockchain stuff is, is not yet consumer friendly. You have to do things like go get a wax wallet and then, and then you have to fund your wax wallet. And it depends on which country you're in or how do you fund a wax wallet? Is it through Binance? Is it through whatnot? So we, we would give you the white glove VIP treatment and walk you, th walk you through that. Um, but being a founder in the game is pretty nice. Um, you know, you're, you know, you know, you get to play the game up front. You get a feedback for us, iterate and change it. Uh, but we're also got loads of benefits coming into you with airdrops coming in every week. So it's going to be, you're going to get paid off a lot more. Plus you get to found access tokens yourself and get to invite people into the game in the future. Um, and it's going to get more and more benefits. We're just going to keep adding stuff to it. Yeah, I went through all that, but I'm kind of a blockchain nerd. So it was a little easier for me than a normal person, but Definitely, I would I would recommend folks if you're really excited about this project like I am, go check that out. Go join their Discord and become a founder and help us help out Eric and his team. Well, thank you so much, Eric. This is a great project, and thank you so much for participating in our conference. I'm sure this will be the first time of many that you do that. And but we wish you all the success with your project, Million on Mars. Thank you very much. Okay, well that concludes our Saturday night event, everyone. We hope you had a good day at our conference today and we'll see you tomorrow morning for day four at 9 a.m. All right, have a great night. Thank you. Hey everybody, thank you for doing this. Thank you, Eric. All right, take care everyone.